Okay, so, so far we've seen what a category is, what functors between categories are, and we saw some examples, and I tried to uh, give motivation why we're doing this in this lecture course. And to get closer to understanding easy, namely topological quantum field theories in lower dimensions, namely two space-time dimensions, um, we need to give where we need to consider more interesting categories. So not very general categories, but those which have extra structure. So in a category, you can compose morphisms, but there's no notion of composing objects. However, with vector spaces, for example, you can compose vector spaces in the sense that you can tensor them together, for example. That's a very important um, operation. And now the next definition of a monoidal category um, gives us a way to also um, com compose or multiply objects in a category, and not only morphisms. So, <laughs> definition. There will be three parts to this definition. A category C, together with additional choices, namely with an object I in C. By the way, very often one doesn't write OB for objects of C and just write C, and then I in C means it's an object in the category C. And so now I specify a category, a special object I, like identity in C, and a functor The functor is denoted with a tensor product symbol. It's a functor from C cross C to C. I should define what the Cartesian product of two categories is, but I don't do it in detail. Objects are pairs of objects. Morphisms are pairs of morphisms, just like the Cartesian uh, product of sets or, or vector spaces and so on. It's very analogous. So it takes two things and produces one thing, in particular objects. And such a category, together with the choice of object, together with such a functor, is called monoidal. If first, so because we have a functor from C cross C to C, we can take two objects, A and C, and B and C, um, and tensor it together to get one object in C. And then we can tensor that with yet another object, C, in script C. And this should be related to the object where we multiply, quote unquote, in this different way. First, um, compute this, this new object B tensor C, and then the object A tensor B tensor C. And you, you might want them to be equal. So you might want to be the multiplication of objects to be associative in the sense for every object A, B, and C. And we would like this special object I for identity to be the identity with respect to this operation of multiplication on objects. So this, you might think, is equal to A, and A is equal to A tensor the identity. And that's a reasonably good definition, but it misses one important aspect of category theory. In, in categories, you have two um, layers of structure. You have the objects and the morphisms between the objects. So it's asking a lot for two objects to be really the same. So most two-dimensional vector spaces are not the same. For example, uh, the free vector space generated by this piece of chalk and this piece of paper is not equal to the, free, uh, to the vector space R2, but they are isomorphic, right? So it, it's asking a lot for two things to be equal, but um, it's asking for some, it's more reasonable often to ask that things are isomorphic. So <clears throat> an isomorphism is a morphism which has a left and right inverse, in the, in a, as you would expect. So I demand that there are specific isomorphisms for every triple of objects and specific um, isomorphisms 
called, uh, these are called alpha for associative, lambda for left action, and rho for right action of I on A. And the, the true definition of a monoidal category says that this is such that certain axioms hold. They are called the pentagon axiom and the triangle axiom. But I won't give them. So they, they won't play a role for what I have to say, on the surface at least. But uh, you can't know what they are unless you know what they are. Yes? I don't, you're asking whether the object I is unique, and I'm, I'm not imposing this condition. So a category together with, this, with an object, um, together with such a functor, is called monoidal if we have uh, such isomorphisms, such that they satisfy certain axioms. But then one can ask, can I prove that something is unique up to isomorphism? And that can be done. So if you fix this functor, then the identity will be unique up to isomorphism which is a lemma. OK? Yes? yes so you, you can define this. You, for, for vector spaces, you can make a monoidal category for the tensor product. Uh -huh. Would it work also for the direct product of vector spaces? Ah, you're asking whether there's more than one monoidal structure on the category of vector spaces? <clears throat> and uh, I will answer that question when I discuss the example in two minutes from now, OK? It, it will be easier for, for most of us to, to uh, follow the, the answer, okay? Please remind me if I forget. Um, so monoidal categories are good because you can um, take the product of objects, but maybe you want to have more symmetry. Maybe you want to have something like a commutativity. And there's various ways this can happen. Uh, I discussed two. So let's say we have a monoidal category C with identity object I and monoidal product tensor. This together with isomorphisms that I call beta AB from the tensor product, well, it's called the tensor product, from A tensor B to B tensor A, <clears throat> which is an isomorphism. such that such that the hexagon axiom which I also don't give but which we can discuss in the exercises so if for monoidal category we have a family of such isomorphisms beta as in braiding, you can um, switch A and B in these tensor products for every object's A and B. You can braid them past each other. <clears throat> this is called braided monoidal. <clears throat> so I'm sorry, it's probably not easily readable. It says braided monoidal. I, I should have come with braids. Uh, OK, and number three, uh, a braided monoidal category can be extra symmetric if the braiding, if these isomorphisms are very nice with respect to one another, which means specifically if I have a braided monoidal category, so a monoidal category CI tensor and the family of braidings beta for every pair of objects A and B, then this is called symmetric monoidal. If the isomorphism beta AB from AB to BA is the same thing as the inverse of beta BA. Both go from A tensor B to B tensor A. And there are two ways how I can go from AB to BA. And it's extra symmetric if these two ways are the same. 
Okay, so there are no extra axioms here. Now let's, let me try and uh, respond to Savant's point. One example of a symmetric monoidal category um, is um, the category of vector spaces. <clears throat> So if I take for C the category of vector spaces, objects are C vector spaces, morphisms are linear maps, together with the usual tensor product of complex vector spaces, that's why I keep track of the uh, index here, together with the very special one-dimensional complex vector space, which is C itself, together with a rating that I'll specify in a moment, I claim is a symmetric monoidal category. abbreviated SIM-MON. So why is that? For example, why is it true that C is the identity object with respect to the tensor product? Well, the one-dimensional C vector space times any other C vector space, uh, tensor any other C vector space, is of course isomorphic to V. Well, I say of course, and maybe you forgot how to see this, but this is something that uh, we learn in linear algebra courses or books. In the special case where V is, fin is uh, finite dimensional, it's easy to see because we know that the tensor product is multiplicative on the dimension. And this is one dimensional, this is finite dimensional, this will have the same dimension, so they're isomorphic. Uh, and this is this isomorphic also to tensoring from the right. And the braiding from V tensor W to W tensor C, uh, tensor V, which takes, for example, an element that is a vector V tensor W and does the outrageous thing of just switching uh, the factors. This satisfies the hexagon axiom. Of course, you know that not every element in this vector space is of this form. So in general, they are finite <coughs> linear combinations of such things. And then you do this just summoned wise. So if I understood correctly, then you were asking whether the Cartesian product would also um, give rise to a monoidal structure. But what would be the... Um, uh, the unit. So I don't see how C could be the unit of that. So C times a vector space where, where we take for times the Cartesian product is not isomorphic to that vector space. So uh, more generally one can prove that the only, up to isomorphism, the only monoidal structure on the category of vector spaces with this tensor product, so the usual tensor product, is this one. That's the only monoidal structure. But it's, it's an actual theorem. And maybe there's a very quick proof, um, but I don't have it in my mind. I know a slightly longer proof. Oh, sorry, you wanted to take the exterior product. No, no the, the, the direct sum, if you want, uh, adding two vector spaces. Oh, um, if you take the direct sum, this will not satisfy the axioms, the pentagon and triangle axiom. Oh, sorry, I, I misunderstood. Yeah. Okay. Um, the example number two concerns the category of bordisms. Objects are circles, morphisms are surfaces whose boundaries are various circles. This together with taking the disjoint union as the tensor product, as the monoidal structure, and taking zero circles, as we discussed, no circles is a specific number of circles, so the empty set viewed as a circle together with a tor for twist that I will define in a moment is also a symmetric monoidal category. Uh, why is that? Uh, 
like here. First, I see that if I take, for example, the disjoint union of no circles with a circle, I get the circle up to a very canonical isomorphism. And if I take the disjoint union with nothing from the right, also this doesn't change anything. Um, the twist map, I, I just, I could have written beta here as well, but it's not the same map as here. That's why I use tau <coughs> for twist instead of beta for braiding. This is a map from two circles to two circles. And that's actually um, more involved than I want to discuss now, but I would like to discuss this in the afternoon in the, se in the exercise sessions. Uh, roughly, in pictures, it's a map from two circles to two circles, and one does it using the so-called cylinder construction. But to go through with the cylinder construction, we have to look at the details of the definition of what bordisms really are, beyond just, uh, ah, these are not quotes, this is an equality sign, uh, beyond just the, these pictures. But the idea is, well, you, you somehow interchange um, the, 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 the circles. Oh, the question is why, why I only look at circles. Uh, th there's no good reason for that. It, it's just an example. It's just from any number of circles uh, here and any possibly different other number of circles. Also here, for, for any number of circles where there's an S1. But I mean, there's no, I mean, at least for me, I don't see the clear We'll discuss it in the exercises if you show up. Now I know what in you look case, like. Uh, in the case uh, where we are looking at topological theories, shouldn't I always be able to untwist this? Uh, the question is whether you always can untwist this. Um, this you can't un untwist, but if you connect the two using a pair of pants, then you can. That's part of the properties of the Bordism category, which I will discuss only tomorrow, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. Um, I thought I would make this, this penultimate definition one hour ago, uh, but we're nearly there. So I'm, I'm one definition away from defining what a two-dimensional closed TQFT is. It's a special kind of functor between symmetric monoidal categories. So I defined just now what symmetric monoidal categories are. Now I want uh, to consider only such functors which are also um, respectful of the monoidal, of the symmetric monoidal structure on both sides. So now I have to define what is a symmetric monoidal functor. <coughs> a functor F from C to D between, and then here I leave some space, monoidal categories. is, I leave some space, monoidal if the following is true. <laughs> if, if I take the tensor product of two objects in C, so I could write uh, calligraphic C here to say that it's a tensor product of the domain category, the source category. This should be isomorphic to <clears throat> the tensor product of f of a with f of b in the target or codomain category d. That's a natural thing to do, right? It wants to be, <clears throat> it should preserve the, the, the monoidal structure. And moreover, it should map the, the identity object of c to the identity object of D up to some isomorphism which has to satisfy some axioms, okay?
That's a monoidal functor, and you're not surprised that a monoidal functor should have these properties, I hope. What, what's a, now let's assume that C and D are actually braided monoidal categories, Then I want to define what is a braided monoidal functor F from C to D. Well, if it should, it should be compatible with the braiding on C and on D. And I write this in the following way. F is compatible with the braidings. And I don't spell out what it means. So I invite you to think about what it might mean. Just like this here means that it's compatible with the monoidal structure, with the tensor products. <clears throat> you can try and think about what, what this means. But we, we will not be using it explicitly. So <clears throat> let me not mention this. Also, if C and D are even symmetric monoidal categories, then what is a symmetric monoidal functor? <clears throat> well, it's a braided monoidal functor together with no additional uh, axiom or no additional thing that I have to ask. That's nice. But I will not explain precisely what the axioms for these isomorphisms are that they won't, won't feature at all in the rest of what I have to say, so I hope that's okay. Well, now we have, now, now we're finally in a position to state precisely what I mean by a, of, by a certain simple kind of two-dimensional topological quantum field theory. It's a map from space-time to its algebraic description or to the algebraic description of what is going on in space-time. So it's a map from, from geometry to algebra, which um, preserves all the structures that we have found. So in other words, definition, a two-dimensional closed TQFT. Everything I will be talking about is two-dimensional, so I don't add this. A two-dimensional closed TQFT is a symmetric monoidal functor from the category of two-dimensional bordisms, which those of you who like to think about string theory can also think of uh, world sheets of closed strings, and the rest is uh, <clears throat> fine not thinking about this, just surfaces or space-time of two, dimension, two dimensions, and the category of complex vector spaces. And I will call this functor not rho and not f, but z, z for Zustandsumme, which is the German word for partition function or state sum or path integral. So what I want to do next is finally clear this board, but only after explaining how this definition encodes items one to eight already of, of this uh, initial um, list of motivation. So <clears throat> claims that now we have features of Q of T. But even without what I'm about to present, I, I hope it makes sense to consider such functors because we have seen how we have natural nice structure of multiplying vector spaces with a tensor product and just taking the disjoint unions of manifolds. So why not ask for those maps from here to here which respect the structure? So number one, Z, the functor in particular, maps objects to objects. So it maps one circle to its image under this functor. And let me call this image 
A. So this is a vector space. And this vector space, we will see, can be interpreted as the space of states. So vector space check. Number two, if we have <clears throat> some surface, say from one circle to one circle, sigma, this is mapped to, with, by a functor z to a linear map from A to A because the functor maps assigns to this circle the vector space A. <coughs> to this circle, it also assigns the vector space A. Hence, to this morphism, which is a surface, it assigns a morphism over here, which is a linear map. So, to a surface, we assign a linear map, which is Z of sigma, and it's a map from A to A. just because it's a functor. And in big quotation marks, let me call this evolution. So it's not a unitary operator necessarily, but at least it's a linear map. So in this sense, uh, I am happy. <laughs> then what about locality? I claimed earlier that locality has something is, is captured by functoriality. So if we have, say, a surface um, that is made up of two surfaces, sigma 2 and sigma 1, and here these two surfaces are somehow glued together, I don't want to say that they all have to be, um, um, have only one connected component. Right? We can always just add spheres, S2, and it's still a surface. There can be as many components as you like. <clears throat> now, if we apply Z to such a composition of a circle, Z2 and Z1, then this is Z of sigma 2 after Z of sigma 1. This is just functoriality, right? Composition in Bohr 2 is mapped to composition in Vect. And this uh, is reminiscent of U21 plus, uh, uh, sorry, UT1 plus T2 is equal to UT2 after UT1. So this is, this captures some part of locality. And all this together here. So, goodness, all this together here, just use the fact that Z is a functor. So far we haven't used that it's symmetric monoidal or anything else, just a functor. Okay. In the interest of time, I become a bit crowded here. Number four, if we apply Z to any number of circles, for example, M times the circle, then we get A tensored as many times with itself, because Z is a monoidal functor, right? The definition up there of a monoidal functor says, <clears throat> up here, uh, down here, says that the monoidal product of two objects is sent to the monoidal product of the two images. And also for any other number m. So m circles here, m vector spaces here. So that means because that is a monoidal functor, all these vector spaces to all these Many, many circles are already determined by what we know about Z doing to just one single circle. So this is uh, independent, and it, it's because 
z is monoidal. Then, how do operators and, and states come in? Well, a state is modeled by, well, in, in quantum physics, uh, a physical state is modeled by a ray in the corresponding uh, Hilbert space or by a vector which represents that ray. And here we, we don't have this extra structure, so here we'll just say a state is an element of the vector space A, the space of states. And then we can see that from a state phi in A, we can get an operator. <clears throat> By an operator, I mean a linear map from A to A, namely the linear map which is produced as follows. And this might be one of the hardest things to, to pass now. Uh, this takes a little bit of getting used to it. So let's apply the functor z to the pair of pans. The pair of pans is a surface from two circles to one circle. So z of that will be a linear map from A tensor A to A. A map from A tensor A to A. So I can apply it to the tensor product of two vectors in A. Let's do that. Or at least let's just apply it to the one fixed vector phi in A and leave open what we put here. So now this is a map from A to A. I wrote element in end of A. It's a linear map from A to A. You plug in a vector in here and you get out a state. So this is an operator. Any questions? Blank. Um, phi tensor blank means that I decide what I put in the first argument, but you can give me any vector, and then I put it in there and I produce a new vector. And in this way, I have a linear map from A tensor A. So for this case, uh, the pair of pants is not just an example, but it's really because you have three. Yes. Two Absolutely, yes. Uh, as you say, uh, it's important that I don't put here uh, any surface, but precisely the pair of pants. I could, but, but then if I, if I would put a hole in here, I would still get an, uh, an operator from a state. However, it wouldn't um, go well with, the, uh, with an, uh, an operation in the opposite direction. So we can get, get from a state to an operator. Let's try to get from an operator to a state. Uh, from an operator, meaning a linear map, O from A to A, we get a state, namely the state that we get by applying the operator O to a very special state. I claim that there's a, a very special, natural, nearly canonical element in the vector space A that comes from the structure of two-dimensional surfaces. Namely, we can apply O to the following vector. We get it by taking a cup, which is a bordism from zero circles to one circle. You, you can take the cup, embed it into R3, put some coffee in it, and feel better. And then you apply Z to that. Now, if you apply Z to this, you get an element of hom c comma a. This whole thing is an, a linear map from c because the empty set is mapped to the unit object in vect, which is c, and the circle is mapped to the object a, the vector space a. <clears throat> so all this here is a linear map from c to a, and this we can now apply to the number one. The number one is an element in C. When we apply this to that, we get an, el an element in A. So the argument here is an element in A, then you apply the endomorphism 
O and you get another. This is the state corresponding to that. And now, as you, as you point out, we could add uh, holes in here, but then first going from a state to an operator, and then using this operator for O, applying it to this thing here called the vacuum, or the unit, then we wouldn't get back the original state phi. So in this, this, <clears throat> this we will discuss in the exercises in more detail and see that uh, this is a caricature of the operator state correspondence in CFT. Yes? Yes, just please. The, the one in the middle, please. So in CFT, the state operator correspondence is only... Can you speak up a bit, please? In, in, in the CFT, the operator state correspondence, and as you built it, you built it to work both ways. But in an ordinary QFT, you can always make an operator go to a state. And this is nice, because for that, you don't need this extra monoidal operation. I mean, you see that you have more structure. That's right. So you can go from an operator to a state because you just apply it to the special state. That's right. <coughs> is, that, is that what you meant? Yeah, I meant that um, you don't need so much structure for that, and that's uh, interesting from the physics standpoint because in an ordinary QFT you can also do that. Uh huh. Uh huh. Good point. Yeah, so my question is, where does the CFT come in? Um, oh. Oh, thank you for the question. The question is, where does the CFT come in? I would like um, to, uh, the CFT to come in tomorrow at the end of the lecture, no later than that, but I'm certain this won't happen. So we, uh, it, it's good that we discuss, but I, I don't have enough time to, to cover this. The, the original idea of the lecture course was that um, we spent uh, some, some time and energy understanding this, this simple topological quantum field theory, see how algebras and categories and so on arise. And then at the end, I wanted to sketch how uh, pioneers like Fuchs, Runkel, Schweigert, and many of their collaborators and many others um, went far beyond that and, um, and used similar ideas on a higher algebraic level, higher categorical level, to also capture CFT. So um, maybe later today or tomorrow, I can make some connections to concrete models, like minimal models in supersymmetric CFTs. Uh, this will be one of my examples. But describing this in detail is far beyond such a short course. Yes, yeah, so my question was not supposed to be critical. Uh, of I understand. But, but more like, like uh, how is this point five now specific to CFT? Because uh, of the state of order. Oh, I see. Uh, so th th this item number five is not specific to CFT because we're not talking about CFT and it holds in the context of topological quantum field theory. Um, but, uh, but, but since uh, we spend so much time thinking about operator state correspondence in CFT and other things that are specific to CFT, I wanted to make this one connection. It's not specific only to CFT because it appears already here. Yes? I didn't understand, sorry. Uh, I mean that you have this fence, uh, and uh, then you uh, set, then ah. introduce the cup, and we just uh, glue the cup from up below, and we get, get the cylinder, which you said that uh, this operator co uh, state correspondence means the identity of the implication. Of yes, you, you, you do this part of the auditorium a great service, and anticipate one of the next things I want to do. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll come back to what you just said in, in some more detail, but, but you're right. So this is a unit. Uh, this particular element here is also a unit for an algebra structure on the vector space A. I'll discuss this after going through points 6, 7, and 8. Um, so far, we, we don't see a Hopf algebra structure, and we will see a certain type of algebra structure, but not a Hopf algebra in soon. It, it will not be a Hopf algebra. So number six was about the operator product expansion. So take two copies of your vector space A and take a special element phi 2 tensor phi 1 in that space. So you take two states. 
Uh, and then this is mapped to Z applied to the pair of pants. This is a map from A tensor A to A. You can apply this to phi 2 tensor phi 1, which is an element of A tensor A. And this is then an element in A. And you can think of this as the operator product expansion, which is simply the product of two vectors in a vector space. Right? So we have at least a product on our vector space A. So it's an algebra, whether it's associative and unital, we haven't discussed yet. But we'll see that it is. But now let's uh, emancipate uh, um, uh, ourselves from the pair of pants and go to other uh, bordisms as well. So we can, in particular, also produce a pairing that is a map from A tensor A to C that I want to call, want to denote by pointy brackets with two placeholders for elements in A. It's a linear map from A tensor A to the complex numbers. It takes phi 2 tensor phi 1 and produces a number out of that, namely the number that we get by choosing to consider this bordisms, uh, this bordism from two circles to zero circles. If we apply the functor z to it, we get the linear map from A tensor A to C. So we can apply this to phi 2 tensor phi 1, and we get, uh, we get uh, a, a number, and this I want to define as phi 2 comma phi 1. That's an, a number in C. And this is the correlator. This pairing is called the bulk correlator in physics interpretations of such functors. <laughs> and we'll, we'll see this in examples as well. And finally, item number eight. That was about the partition function or the state sum. So um, the path integral or the state sum for a fixed space time is somehow an average sum of all possible states and it's used to compute correlation functions and possible outcomes in experiments. Now let's take such a possible space time, sigma g. So this is meant to be uh, an endomorphism or view this as an endomorphism in the bordism category from the empty set to itself. So it's a close, compact, oriented uh, genus G surface. And apply Z to that. So it's a map from C tensor C. So it's an endomorphism of C, which, of course, is isomorphic as the vector space to C. So up to this isomorphism, this gives us a number. Right? So every closed surface of any genus, a TQFT, gives us a number. And the interpretation of this number is that it's the path integral or the state sum. And the state's sum to that number on that particular space-time sigma g. OK. So uh, I'm fairly OK with myself. Uh, I, went to, I went through uh, items 1 to 8, and we found something that is at least reminiscent, given a symmetric monoidal functor from bordisms to vector spaces, but maybe rightly so, you might still think, okay, functors, they seem to be uh, not too bad in, in this setting, but um, is there maybe a way that is easier for us? I mean, given the way we've been socialized and uh, our brains work, maybe there's something more compact to encode the same information about the TQFT as a functor. And this is where I want to go next. So 
on top of what I want to write there, let's say that let z from board to to vect be a closed t q of t. Now I want to do something that is sometimes referred to as the classification of two-dimensional closed TQFTs. I want to um, rewrite this definition in terms of a functor, in terms of language that we're more familiar with. <laughs> so, sure. Um, uh, the condition would be that we don't understand very well what I'm saying, but I have about five minutes. Okay, well then I'll just um, uh, use this board and get as far as I can. If we have such a functor, then we've seen already that the circle S1 is sent to a vector space that we called A. Moreover, the pair of pants, which is a morphism from two circles, is sent uh, to one circle is sent to a linear map from A tensor A to A. It takes elements phi 1 and phi 2 and sends it to something that I want to call phi 2, phi 1. Imagine a dot or some other multiplication sign. So we, we have a multiplication on that vector space A. And now I want to prove that it's associative. This is an associative multiplication. Why? Because <clears throat> what does associative mean? First multiply two elements and then multiply from the right another element. It's the same thing as first multiplying the first one, the two on the left, and then multiply what, is re what remains on the right. Uh, on the side of two-dimensional geometry, this means first multiplying the two on the left, you use a pair of pants, and then you multiply yet another one and you have this bordism from three circles to one circle. And you can compare that where the rightmost two circles are closer to one another. Then you get this one. But in board two, they are the same. Well, they, they represent the same equivalence class of bordisms up to diffeomorphism, because basically it varies continuously between the two. So associativity comes from that. Moreover, to a cup, the one with the coffee, um, we get a map Z of cup, which is a map between the C vector space C for the empty set here and the C vector space A for, from the circle but this is isomorphic to A for every vector space A. <clears throat> and uh, this is a unit. This is a unit for this associative multiplication because, and I think this is what I understood of your comment earlier, uh, if I multiply, say, um, with this unit from the left, then I would have a pair of pants and attach on the left side such a cup, then I get a map from one circle to one circle, but this represents the same equivalence class as just the cylinder. So multiplying with the cup from the left in, in both is as good as uh, um, using the pair of pants, as good as the identity here. So now what we've achieved is to, to see that every closed TQ of T understood as such a functor gives rise to an algebra, whereby algebra, I mean, 
a C vector space A together with a multiplication that is associative. Well, this means phi 3, phi 2, phi 1 is equal to phi 3, phi 2, phi 1 for every element phi 1 to 3 in A. There's a unit, and that's what I mean by algebra. <coughs> and tomorrow, <coughs> I'm sorry, so uh, tomorrow um, I will continue with this list and look at one or two other bordisms and see that there's more structure than just an associative algebra. We also have this pairing here, and then we'll find that a TQFT in two dimensions that is closed is equivalent to a commutative Frobenius algebra. And I'll explain exactly what that is, and then I'll give three or four examples of such algebras. And then we move on to greater things. Thanks.